All right, we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. I uh, hope your DrupalCon has been good so far. Hope we can start off uh, the last day of sessions with uh, something you'll something you'll remember. Uh, my name is Jake Strawn uh, on Drupal.org and around the rest of the internet. Uh, I go by Emerus. And today we're going to be talking about. Uh, actually, I really wanted to change the title of this, but. I had the 85 words in here for so long that I really couldn't. Uh, we're really going to be focusing on responsive web design, mobile-first technologies, and how to accomplish those in Google. Uh, a lot of this uh, other buzzwords that continue to change in the industry and what they're defined as, but it all really boils down to the same thing. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is mobile. How many of you in the audience in the 10 minutes prior to the session started used a mobile or tablet device? Fair enough. How many of you used a desktop, laptop, or laptop? There's too many of you. It wasn't supposed to be that many. So types of mobile devices. Uh, a lot of times when we start thinking about what we want to present to Mobile users, the first thing we're thinking about is the kind of phones that we're using. The people in this room are more likely carrying an Android or an iPhone. However, mobile is not just Android and iOS. And I think most of us already know that. But the smartphones that we carry are capable of doing a lot of things. Uh, they're capable of, you don't even have to build somebody a mobile website. It just shrinks it, it looks okay, you can zoom and pan. But a huge percentage of people are still using feature phones. And these are low-end devices that simply don't have the processing power. Only, uh, maybe they can't even display JavaScript. And they're only capable of really rendering a very simplistic page, sometimes even without CSS. As it currently stands, uh, at least this was a couple months ago, about 30, to, I believe it was, percent of users are on smartphones. Uh, that's said to be more of a 50-50 split by the end of this year. But again, with that being said, we actually have a wide group of mobile devices that we need to cater to. And you can look at it like maybe some of us do with IE6, and now I don't want to build for those. But when a lot of countries are still not strong in smartphones, we really need to be able to focus on all kinds of devices. There's one way to do, to figure out what type of device somebody's using and send them content, and that's user agent detection. And according to most people in most circumstances, probably 99% of the time, that is not the correct way to be doing things. Uh, with tens in, upon tens of thousands of user agents with the ability to fake your user agent and become some other type of browser, like your Firefox plugin that will pretty much emulate anything, that's not the way we should be approaching mobile devices. That's how you're going to get a very iPhone-specific website, but not something that's actually going to cater to everybody. So this is where we come to mobile first. And the problem has been that, more often than not, the mobile version of a website is the last thing a client and a lot of times even the developer or designer thinks about. We've got a you know, rich experience going on a 1200 or 12, 1200 pixel desktop, and then the client's ready. Well, we want to do mobile too. So now we have to go back and start hacking it apart and making it work. We need to be thinking about the mobile version of the website right off the bat. The lowest common denominator of anybody that's going to come to any website you build is on a feature phone, is on a mobile phone. So it's going to go from feature phone to smartphone to tablet. And then finally, somebody who's on a laptop or desktop is capable of rendering some advanced things. So we need to be thinking about the lowest common denominator first. And some of the current statistics, obviously, everybody, the nominee empty seats, everybody knows mobile is exploding. That's what we need to start focusing on. Uh, projected to be a billion users uh, by 2013, so a little over a year. Uh, 
Mobile users are increasing over desktop clients by a factor of eight. Uh, smartphone sales will surpass the PC sales by the end of this year. So more people will be buying Androids, iPhones, maybe a Windows Phone 7 here or there, uh, if you count that one. So by the end of this year, there are going to be more people buying mobile devices than there will be Dells or anything like that. Um, over half of the current smartphone users spend more than 30 minutes per day using mobile web, mobile applications. How many of you fall into that category? At least 30 minutes a day. That's about half. Very good. <sighs> Thinking about mobile forces you to focus on what you want to deliver to your client. We get carried away when designing sites for the desktop when we have so much real estate to put all of these ads, to put all of this content, related stuff. But when, when it boils down to it, what are you really trying to accomplish? What are the three things on your site that are most important? So mobile, thinking about what a mobile user needs to see makes you kind of conceptualize differently so that you know that if we're talking about a conference site like DrupalCon, if you noticed uh, visiting the site throughout the week, every day the homepage has changed to the current day schedule. All the people that are going to the site today probably want that. So the same thing kind of applies in a mobile technology. What do you want somebody on that lowest common denominator to be able to see? So with a little intro to the mobile stuff, we'll talk responsive web design and how that plays into this. First off, what is responsive? And it was originally defined by Ethan Marcos as the practice of using fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries to progressively enhance a web page for different viewing contexts. So there we go. There's our mobile. There's our tablet in multiple viewing uh, lands, uh, orientations. And then there's our big desktop some guy with an 80-inch monitor. And I liked the definition, I agree. And a couple months after I gave um, actually the first run of this, um, Jeffrey Zeldin posted something that essentially says, Ethan's definition was great, and that's what he came up with. The, it had, but it had to be a fluid grid. It had to use uh, flexible images, which is putting a max width and in new browsers, they scale, and the media queries. If you use any bit of JavaScript, if you use anything else, that's not responsive. That's not what that is. So there was a lot of the adaptive or responsive. There was a lot of back and forth about, well, what's the difference? What are those? And for quite a while, I couldn't even tell you. And so what his post kind of boiled down to is that it's not the exact approach. It doesn't necessarily have to be a fluid grid. Uh, don't uh, have to have media queries even. But it's, it's the uh, end goal that we get to. Being able to dis deliver the same website to different devices while giving them all the appropriate, the appropriate content, the appropriate user interface. Some examples um, for those of you that uh, are a little unfamiliar will really help you get kind of an idea. The first one is Coley.com, C-O-L-L-Y. And this is one of the first um, that I know of great examples of responsive design. And as that first uh, desktop slide came up, uh, there's four columns. You know, everything's you know, designed really simply and clean. But as you continue to scroll your browser down or look at it on the different device, depending on your screen width, you're going to have either the two column you can see on the right, or the one column is the mobile version on the left. Uh, the Sasquatch Music Festival. Uh, this is uh, very well graphically done. And if we notice the menu on these items, and then when the mobile version comes up here, we see that their main navigation has been slimmed down to four things. The most important four things. And the first link is schedule. Because what's somebody on a mobile device potentially right there at the event? What do they want? That can already and has already been done in Drupal quite a bit, actually. Um, one of the first examples was the Four Kitchens website that they did a few months back. Um, it does use 
the fluid grid. So as you start out at a large resolution and scale your browser down, you're going to see these different shifts in how the, the primary items on the page layout. And in the bottom two, you can see how the uh, navigation has become a little different as well, making it a little more friendly for a mobile device and you know, making it you kind of emulate a button that's a little bigger to click on than a small text link. Uh, the Omega microsite uh, was recently relaunched on the same uh, concept. Uh, it's fluid, goes up to a 1200 pixel maximum, and has a mobile version where everything is now stacked up, certain elements are not displayed. Uh, but if you, if you go to that URL and you scale down, you will actually see during the, during the scale all the way to mobile from 1200 pixels, you get a lot of different enhancements that happen at different points during the page. Certain images get bigger at a certain point and they're only two in a row or they shrink down. The side text is right there with it or maybe it's below it. Uh, KMU Business Partners, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's Amazie Labs. Uh, the booth upstairs did this one. And this was one of the first ones uh, that was sent to me that was really amazing uh, from somebody that had just dug into uh, responsive and the Omega theme at the time. And as it's fluid as well, as you scale the page, everything goes away. The large picture of the gentleman on the desktop, as soon as you get just a little bit smaller than 1200 pixels, it goes away. It's not important. It looks great on the desktop version of the site, but that doesn't need to be on the mobile version. Uh, another one I worked on, uh, Drupal Camp New Hampshire, uh, it's coming up in a couple months has actually four sizes, a 1200 pixel, a 960, a 720, and a mobile version. Uh, I didn't actually spend much time on the design for the mobile, uh, but you can see uh, on the desktop versions, really slim navigation at the very top, looks like a little Mac menu bar. But when you get to mobile, you have some really giant buttons. You got, you, you, it's just gonna make it easy for someone to use, and the people that will actually be coming to the site on their mobile device are pretty much only the ones there at camp that day. Recently, Acquia relaunched their main site, Acquia.com, uh, using Omega. There are a couple of small responsive enhancements in here with more planned in the future. Uh, there's a few things that uh, kind of shift with the fluid layout uh, to get down to a little bit better viewing on a tablet. Um, they haven't actually done the full mobile version yet with uh, time concerns. So how do we get to this? How do we, how do we implement this on our own sites? <laughs> there are quite a few ways that you can implement these methods, that you can start delivering the same web page that's enhanced depending on what, what device the user is using. If we start with JavaScript, um, one of the best methods is adapt.js by Nathan Smith. I've uh, been a big fan of this for a long time with 960. And what adapt.js does is on the, I believe the page load and then the uh, browser resize, it continues to detect the size of the screen. And if you get below a certain point, this is all configurable through some JavaScript settings. If it gets below a certain point, it's going to switch the CSS that it's using for the grid. So instead of a 960, all of a sudden it may shift down to a 600 pixel grid. The benefits of this, uh, it does work in all browsers as long as JavaScript is turned on. And that only becomes a problem when we look at much older feature phones that cannot handle JavaScript. Um, if you're not using a mobile first approach with adapt.js, you're gonna have problems on those older phones. The CSS method. Using media queries, which we're all already familiar with, they've been around since the start of CSS2, we've used media all, print, screen, dis display, all those. Now we have in CSS3, min width, max width, min device width, min, or max device width. We're able to use these to actually detect the capabilities of our browser. 
That's what we're really wanting to look for. We don't care that it's a BlackBerry that's three years old. We want to know that they have a 320 pixel wide resolution. That's all we want to know. The benefits of this, it works in all modern browsers. So anything before IE9, it's not going to happen. Um, all the new smartphones, and even uh, one I have that's a couple years old, understands media queries just fine. Um, the only uh, the only real issue here uh, is dealing with IE. The, the previous versions of IE, if you're really, if you have to implement the same responsive layouts, or maybe you can just go to some kind of default. Uh, any browser that doesn't understand the CSS3 media queries will simply ignore them. That's again the reason for mobile first. If you go to an old mobile browser that doesn't understand it, it's just going to say, okay, and I've already got my simplest version of the page being the mobile version. And any browser that's smart enough to look at it is going to understand and continue to enhance the page. Combining the methods, if you are going the CSS3 media query route and you must have it for the previous versions of IE, you can look at respond.js. And what it essentially does is it's a polytittle that is going to hopefully, I've never tested it, I know some people said they've had success with it, but it's going to emulate the media queries in those old browsers. It's going to make it so the old versions of IE understand it, kind of like the HTML5 shiv that you put in so that it understands some of the new tags in HTML5. So combining the methods, depending on your requirements, can be really good because you've really covered every base you should have it in any system working appropriate. We can really spend quite a bit of time here discussing which one is right. And no matter what, it really boils down to the clients you're dealing with, uh, but more importantly, how you approach your clients. Um, a lot of the reading I've been doing and a lot of the work that I've been doing for clients is now from someone who actually understands that a mobile version is more important than a pixel-perfect drop shadow in every browser ever made across the world. It's more important that they approach this rapidly growing uh, mobile market rather than worrying about the details and let's build on our way up. Let's progressively enhance so that once we get to these desktop versions and somebody's using Firefox 14, they can display anything they want and put in a lot of great stuff targeted to the contemporary browsers. How can we implement these now in Drupal? The first methods, that, the methods I just discussed, are great. You can use them. You can start building out a one-off theme for a client with these, no problem. If you're looking for something a little more out of the box, there's currently one base theme in Drupal for Drupal 7 that has already tackled all this, has already handled this, and taken all of these approaches into account. Uh, I've actually been working on Omega for about two years. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, during Dries' keynote, I actually launched the stable version uh, that I'll be talking about some of the features for. And it's really grown from something that started off as my own need to just fill a theme that I started with for every project, to now becoming something that has finally gained a lot of community support, has a lot of people contributing to the project, and has even had someone come in and practically rewrite all of my crappy code and make it worth everybody in the room actually using it. Some of the features. First off, obviously, responsive grids. Out of the box, it ships with 720, 960, 1200 pixel grids, a fluid grid, and uses the mobile first concept. So if you scroll your browser all the way down with clean install, you're going to get all your regions stacked in place. You're going to have perfect looking basic mobile site ready to go. To continue to grow out, you're going to shift, enhance, get different layouts at different sizes as you move along. Mobile first approach. Uh, some of the rewrites that have happened uh, over the past six months uh, since DrupalCon Chicago uh, the code was completely rewritten. 
Um, there's some advanced caching going on that really speeds things up. I wrote some, I don't know how deep if and crazy looping things that are all now gone and everything's performing well. And CSS aggregation. And when we were building out the responsive, uh, the responsive features, all of a sudden we had, I don't know, 50 different uh, CSS includes in the header because each media query in Drupal, when it gives it media, media all and then with 420 pixels, that'll create its own group during the page build. So it was way too many. So what we do now, once you turn on CSS, CSS aggregation, in Drupal, um, it all gets compressed into one, everything is written appropriately, and you don't have a thousand includes trying to accomplish all this. Every zone and region is easily configurable. There are three main page elements, and one thing that this theme does, uh, you will probably never have a need to edit a page DPL again. Um, I haven't in actually over a year now. Uh, so we have three main page level elements in the HTML5 version. The header, the section which holds all the main content, and footer. You can place a zone, which in Omega, the zone was a new concept that came along about a year, year and a half ago, that the zone is a container for the regions. The regions needed to be grouped so that any type of grid properties or any type of main stuff would work with that. So currently you place blocks in a region. This is the same thing for regions. You place regions in the zone. So you can place any of these zones, any of these regions, anywhere you want to place on the fly in the back end. Uh, true to the 960 grid concepts uh, that I've been using for many years now, um, you have the ability to, in each group of regions, again a zone, you're able to pick which one you want displayed first on the page and which one you want displayed first in the source order. And you can order any region that way, any way you want. And that's great for the content first, SEO, anybody that really wants their content first on page. That also helps with mobile first. If you start doing stacking, your, your content, you want to be at the top. We've added in a few new things that uh, kind of simplify adding in a special CSS, special JavaScript. Because uh, I always had the use case where I would build out a certain CSS JavaScript file that I didn't want everywhere on the site. I didn't want to include it in the styles or script, style sheets or scripts, uh, elements that Drupal themes have by default. So we have some new grid arrays in the theme.info file that allow you to define these and then enable or disable them via the theme setting GUI. So this is great because a lot of people that are using Omega or are using any base theme for that matter, each company kind of builds out their own sub theme of that. It's their base thing. Already has all their custom tweaks in it. It's ready to go. You know, it's, a, it's a little more configured to their liking to get started with. This makes that easy because you know, maybe your base thing had a couple extra JavaScript enhancements that I ah, don't need it for this client. You can quickly turn them off. You now have the ability, uh, as I mentioned, Omega comes with 720, 960, 1200 include grids. You can now define your own grids. Uh, the site screenshot in the background is the one linked off of 960GS, where you can generate any grid size you want, any gutter width you want. So for those that don't like 960, you can make it 566 if you want to. You can do whatever you like, and the, the base theme implements it. You can put this in your .info file. You essentially define a couple things, and you have your own grid that you can now define your own media query for and are able to use that however you see fit. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things, and this is kind of silly for the slider presentation, but one of the biggest things that was ever requested was equal heights, regions, and blocks. That's in there now. That works quite like a charm. Uh, the biggest thing was a simplified theme settings interface. And I'll use the word simple, simple as some people will say it as a sum wall. Uh, there's a couple hundred form elements that you can configure, do a lot of things with, but as you get to dig in, it's really quite simple to move a region to another zone. And a lot of the things we've uh, been talking about here in London are how we're going to take the next step, how we're going to build a drag and drop interface 
allow you to resize, uh, scale regions on the fly, drag and drop into different locations, either through a back-end interface or potentially live in front of the site. Uh, so that's a lot of the talk that's been going on. But the usage of this is actually, uh, besides a little bit, of, a little bit of documentation that's missing at this point, uh, there's now over 5,000 installs of Omega, uh, usually 30 to 50 in the Drupal Omega IRC every day. So there's a lot of support, there's a lot of people out there using it. Some of the sites that are using Omega, not all of these are using the Drupal 7 as well. But there's a lot of large sites running Omega with a lot of traffic, a lot of, uh, a lot of visibility. Now, so we talked about the mobile, mobile first and responsive. There's some places where currently in Drupal 7, and we hope it'll be fixed in Drupal 8 uh, from previous keynote now, there's actually a mobile, or potentially going to be a mobile initiative that will handle this and responsive, uh, responsive ideas in core. Uh, when I actually made this slide, I hadn't heard of that initiative. <coughs> But the two things that are really going to make this happen are the context core initiative and the Drupal 8 design initiative. Uh, the problem with the mobile first right now in Drupal is, well, if you say that your biggest version of your website is 1,200 pixels, or your smallest is you know, going to work at 240 on the smallest phone you can find, what happens when you have an image preset that you know, the image is the full width of the page, it's 1,200 pixels? You can use the fluid images, which is just going to scale it down, but you still sent your mobile user an image that was 500K, maybe even a meg. Um, and that's a big problem. There's ways on a one off case that you can do this. You can you know, use some job, JavaScript, you can load a low res <coughs> version first, and then do some determination to know that, okay, we found out, yes, they are on a big screen, so let's feed them the larger version. But there's a lot of things here where, uh, with the web services and context coordinates, that we, it seems like we're going to be able to better understand what's, what's requesting the page, what we really want, and provide the context that will let us know what we can use, and if we want to ship an entirely different page to the mobile user, that might be possible. Um, originally, I said uh, I worked on the Omega theme for about two years. Uh, and about six months ago, after DrupalCon Chicago, I had uh, someone come to the IRC room and say, yeah, this is pretty great. I tried it. And it's all neat and stuff, but your code really sucks. I'd like to help you rewrite it some. And this was actually the first person that uh, was able to step, to the, step up to the plate, take a lot of it off my shoulders, and really make a huge contribution so, Sebastian, in the front row, please. <laughs> and I can't even begin to imagine how many hours he spent on this over the last six months and how much I've spent kind of making sure he didn't rewrite it another dozen times. Um, resources, uh, I did actually have some slides in here with a bunch of links, but they were too long to, uh, to even look at on the screen. I know it's kind of hard to see the screen here. So uh, on the session page on the DrupalCon site, all the links have been uh, put in there, the entire session outline. I will upload slides at some point as well. But uh, all, the, all the posts that are mentioned, uh, Sebastian and mine's contact information, all that's there. <coughs> I would like to introduce you guys to Michelle. Michelle's a little lot. Michelle's smart. Michelle is beautiful. 
Michelle is the love of my life. And today I want to ask her, <laughs> Michelle, will you marry me? Can we use that? Can that be the only determinant? Exactly. Or, or do we actually need other uh, information? Okay. So the question was that with all different laptop sizes, some older stuff, all these things, is using Max with and with the CSS screen sizes, is that the best way or the only way that we should be paying attention to? Um, if you are kind of paying attention to the guys that have created this, the whole responsive and everything. That really seems to be enough. Uh, I mean, that laptop that, for whatever reason, has a 480 pixel setup, uh, you know, it's probably going to use an IE5 or something like that. So I, I, you know, I can't imagine what advanced browser it's using, so it already needs its own simplified version of everything. Um, if a client is really willing to some client may have, 90% of their customers may be using that little junky laptop. And if that's the case, I mean, then that's when still something like device detection may be appropriate. Um, but the, the problem with that is, with the device detection, is it takes so much time. Not many clients really have the time to pay for that. I mean, they'll be upset when they paid for a special Android version. Well, it doesn't work on anything else. We're only detecting to see if it was this one specific. So I really think it's enough. Um, in the Omega theme, actually, we have like a fallback for the i6, 7, and 8 that doesn't understand media queries and doesn't, doesn't know what size screen it's on. Uh, except for the IE Mobile in i6, 7, and 8, uh, it will just display the, a default grid one you set in the interface. So it would just get 960 by default. So I think it's really enough to just pay attention to screen size currently. But in a month, that may change. Uh, back.
Right, you know, there are two different events that you can use. Yeah, there are two different events that you can use. And we're not using the body load event, we're using the you know, document load event, the window load event, and that's happening after the event load. Yeah, that's kind of laid out, that's very much. Right, yeah, so it jumps. That's good. Is there any way to test the different sizes? Yeah, like Okay. There may be a lot of better ones that I don't even know of myself. I currently just use, uh, every now and then I fire up the IE, uh, the Windows Phone 7 emulator, and I don't really worry about Android and iPhone because I know they're pretty capable. And uh, I actually just use Chrome a lot because you can grab and resize all the way down to 400 pixels wide. You, you can't get down to the really small, like if it was a 240 or 320 width, but it really covers most of the bases to know that, you know, in a pretty narrow layout that you have most of what you want. Uh, the only drawback to that is if you're using a lot of other advanced stuff like CSS3 gradients and drop shadows that may not work on the mobile. And if you're doing that in Chrome, it will still look like they work. But I, I tend to do it really simply just with just with some normal techniques and a lot of scrolling the browser around. Uh, you know about the panels, the, the, the work of the panels together? Actually, just uh, about a week, week and a half ago, we finally got some patches in uh, for panel support um, that will handle, I, I don't personally use panels much, if ever, anymore. It will handle, I think, uh, anything that's nested inside the panel and handle the right grid, grid classes based on your container elements. Uh, so it should work well. I know there was a couple more patches coming a little bit later, maybe for a couple little tweaks in that, but it does work for those that are still using games. Can you speak a little bit about using image cache on the different uh, screen sizes and content? Absolutely. That's, uh, it's a great question. It's been one uh, pretty much every time I talk about it. Because again, if you have 1,200 pixels is your maximum width on the screen, and you have a, a, a slideshow that is the full width of that, you know, you're going to need an image cache preset that's 1,200 pixels, and those are large images. I mean, those are no small task. So what happens if you're scaling down, and you were loading 10 images in the slideshow, but so, so let's say that total of uh, four megs of image data that we're perfectly capable on our laptops and desktops. It's you know, no problem with bandwidth usually. But once you get down to the mobile, what do you do? Because um, going back to Ethan Marcotte's definition of the flexible grid or fluid grid flexible images, the flexible images uh, is something he also posted about on his blog that all it does is add a CSS max width property to every image. And so as you scale, in this case, it would scale down and it would look perfect. Uh, there's some JavaScript that handles it on lower browsers, but you still send them the whole thing. That's where I think, and I've had several discussions on it so far this week. Um, if there's a huge concern for that, which honestly there really should be, um, the best way to do it using a mobile first approach is you're going to take and load the lowest resolution image you can. So if you've got four responsive sizes you're dealing with, you're going to want to have four image cache presets. So load your smallest one by default. And once the page is loaded, there's some JavaScript that fires in Omega and it determines which layout you're in. It knows you're in mobile, it knows you're in uh, a wide screen, whatever it may be. You can use that to fire off and potentially replace those images uh, with the high res only if it's the bigger. Uh, that stuff is not built in because it's way too specific to a single use case. I, we haven't thought of a way to really make that portable yet because everybody's image uh, presets are going to be different. Uh, we can't really make those assumptions. So on the one-off, it's possible to do some of that. And for me, on the, the couple that I've really implemented so far with this latest version, I probably should have done that, but it just wasn't super important to me at the time. So I'm just sending mobile phones a ton of, a ton of extra data. But that's kind of a problem that, in general, Drupal has, regardless of what you're using right now. There's not much of a way unless you're really taking a lot of time and energy to do that. Um, yeah. 
What was your question on supporting the bandwidth? Like, that was it? Okay. Um, well, that, I don't know if anybody's really tackled that yet. Um, I don't know how you would really go about determining. You know, yeah, I mean, it, my iPad, for example, will show a glorious 960 website and it's, you know, all of its beauty, but if I was on a horrible connection, well, then what? Should it go down and show me a mobile version that's much more simplified? Um, that's definitely something to think about. I definitely don't even know how to approach that during time. I don't know if I've even seen anything that really does. Say that again, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, there's two in OER, there's two starter kits. There's the HTML5 version and there's an XHTML. Uh, the XHTML works perfectly with our EFA. Uh, it will validate, um, but through any theme in Drupal 7 right now that's implementing HTML5. Uh, so if you use that starter kit and turn it on REF and try to try to validate your page, there's going to be errors because the HTML5 plus REFA spec is not official, it's not recognized by anything. There's not one in the interface. Um, maybe that's a good feature request, or maybe that's something I don't know if I, I personally would just do that in my core CSS, my main file. But, Defined it. Um, there actually does need to be a little bit better set of typography and of, of that type of spacing out of box. But. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, two and a half years ago, uh, I moved from Denver, Colorado to New Hampshire for a job, and Michelle worked there. And one more later. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I will say this. Of the responsive designs I've done so far, two of which were in some of the screenshots, those are for myself or my local Drupal community. Uh, I'm starting next week on one with a client who's very excited about it. I've had talks with many that it's exciting stuff. You know, a client that recognizes that, that recognizes that mobile is hot, everybody's on a mobile phone, everybody's got a smartphone, whatever it may be, that can also adapt to these technologies. It's really easy to sell. When the mobile usage is what it is, and I don't know how many tablets I've seen in the room. When you're able to approach your client, like the defaults for the defaults for the grid sizes being 720, the first one is that's perfect in portrait mode on an iPad. You turn it to uh, landscape mode, the 960 fits in perfectly. You go up to a browser, or we went all the way back down to mobile. For some clients, we'll never get. They're going to want again a pixel perfect shadow in 96. Those clients. Not for them. Um, and I've been reading some stuff lately that really talked about how to approach your clients. And I think the biggest takeaway I've had so far, I've still got several chapters to read in this one, was ask them what's worth more. Mobile? Would you like me to quickly, out of the box, just throw you a mobile version of your site? It's clean and easy to use. Or would you rather have rounded corners in IE6? Okay. So that's been my experience so far. The people I've been in contact with are excited about this. And if there are going to be plenty of clients that are not on board with, and I found it didn't take much more time 
uh, a little bit. My first run actually took quite a bit more, but it was just me playing around with some other CSS stuff. Uh, all this can be done really quickly. Set a set of global you know, CSS that applies to your mobile version, and your mobile version is ready to go, and then bust the comp out, and it'll, if, you, if you CSS your comp appropriately for, say you're designed to put it on a 960, it'll work as long as you do the CSS right at 1200 or 720. Kind of shrinking it down a bit. So, yeah, I say it's probably 50 50. Some clients are going to be like, you're crazy, I you know, don't want that. And a lot are going to be really excited by the potential of mobile tablet sizing, things like that, and serving targeted versions or layouts to those, to their clients. Is Drupal aware? Uh, Question was when it uh, if in oh my god actually shift grids it goes seven twenty nine sixty twelve hundred when it switches is Drupal aware no uh, the <clears throat> there's a JavaScript there's a JavaScript event that fires that would potentially be able to go in and do some custom code that Drupal needed to know uh, and that's again some of the discussions I've been having based on now well if I'm on that portrait mode tablet version, maybe I want to totally get rid of some regions. And right now, I would just do that quickly in CSS. But again, you're still sending too much data. So um, that's where hopefully some of these things in Drupal 8 will come out, and Drupal will be able to be aware of some of these things really quickly and out of the box. Um, but for now, it's really not. But if the use case requires it to be, it can be. A little bit of custom code. Uh, each of the layouts and any, like the whole point of uh, putting your custom grid, you can then get your own CSS file. So by default, they're called, uh, mobile's always first. So it's often global CSS. Everything that's mobile goes there. Everything's default site-wide, including mobile. Uh, when you first turn it on, there's narrow, normal, and wide. Each of those has its own custom CSS file. There's also a default that applies to all three of those. So if your mobile's totally different, you can use your default to start defining stuff that's global on all the responsive versions. And then in each of those specific ones, if there are overrides, and my slideshow example is the perfect one, so in the normal, the slideshow should only be 400 pixels wide. When you got the wide, it should be 600. So you can chain the CSS that way and override as you go up, rather than the, what used to always be the tradition is build out the desktop site first and override to get back to mobile. The other way you're just going in reverse. I can't tell you honestly, I usually build my own slideshows. I have found a model that I love cleaning out of the box with those. Um, I haven't noticed any issues like in the queue really specific to any of those. Um, the, biggest, the biggest thing is they're not responsive ready. So that's where you kind of have to take into account either that uh, flexible image set up with a max width property in CSS or using, uh, using some kind of uh, JavaScript to load a low res then load higher depending on. Um, there really shouldn't be any uh, issues. Yes, if you load it up by default and your image cache preset is 960 pixels, as you scroll down, scroll down to the smaller one without any adjustments, yeah, it's going to fly off the page. So each you know element like that, you really kind of have to pay special attention to actually work throughout each of those responsive layouts. The problem with those JavaScript uh, libraries, the common types of JavaScript libraries, um, they always set the pixel with one of the images. That's the problem. It's not
Excellent. Yeah, we'll put them in the comments maybe for the session. That'd be great. So there are some ways out there. I mean, it, it really is possible. Just a little care. How do you go about restructuring the menu? Well, um, that's again kind of the problem that right now Drupal's unaware. Right now, you know, we're not we're not really sending different data. Uh, I have done that on a couple things, and I'm simply using CSS to hide. If I've got eight items in my main menu on the big thing, but four of them are just contact form about us, um, I'll just on the mobile CSS those items out. Not the most efficient way, but it kind of works. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mobile first. How does Google have responded to you when you're doing, you know, like display none on your mobile? Don't use display none. <laughs> <laughs> don't use display none. Uh, it's really a good question, and that's. I don't think uh, actually using display none has a giant impact. I don't know. I gave up on paying attention to SEO years ago, but usually the sites I put up do well enough. Um, I would love to hear somebody who's an SEO expert really get into some of this. I think the biggest problem would be is if, if Drupal were aware, like some of these questions have pointed to, if Drupal were aware of what was going on, knew you were on a mobile device, but you're still at example.com, not m.example. You're on the main website, but because it knew you were on a mobile device, if it sent you a dumbed down page, that might be what really affects a lot of SEO. I think that's where the real problem would lie. Anything else, just using element visible or you know, display none, if you feel like it. I, I don't think that's a huge impact. Yeah. Best places to put what? What was on the very last part? Best places? Right. Um, on the first part of uh, what the question was kind of, you know, if there were any real stats on what mobile, uh, mobile and commerce were doing. Like, you know, how many people are doing things like that. Um, I actually had a couple of discussions earlier in the week, um, and I know here in the UK it's pretty big. Um, I've bought, personally, I've bought a couple of things on my Android phone, uh, but I think right now the numbers are so slim because you get to, you're on your iPhone and you get to a version of the full website that's just been scaled down and you're you know, pinching and zooming everywhere you go, it's not really usable to get people to buy things quickly. So I think that's something that you know, needs to be addressed in these mobile designs that you know, make it so that consumers can have a good user experience quickly on their mobile. Add a cart, check out, done. And I think that is 100% possible. It just really hasn't been tackled yet. Nobody's really, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's hundreds of websites out there that have great mobile uh, commerce options. Um, and as far as the usability stuff, I mean, for example, uh, add a card, you know, where do you put it, or how do you make sure it's prominent when you're on a mobile version when the above the fold is now much smaller. Um, I think if, if that's why to do mobile first. If you, that add a card button may need to be the first thing in the content. That may need to be the first thing above the, the title of the product, the node. Um, and then as you scroll up, then you can, with CSS or you know any other kind of trickery, move it somewhere else. You know, now it can be something big and a little lower down. It's really obvious on the desktop and not on the mobile. So I think it all comes down to uh, you know, a designer thinking the right way and a thing to implement the right way so that in mobile it shows up appropriately and it works. Oh, it's about lunchtime. No more questions. <laughs> I need a cigarette after all this. I <laughs> <laughs>
to take the uh, session page. Uh, there's a survey link there. Um, rated actually on the presentation part. And, <laughs> and I'll be around all afternoon. If anybody has any questions wants to come up, please feel free to ask. Thank you. When's the date? <laughs> <laughs> Not answering that. <laughs>